how I'm like, huh? No, I, I want to make sure you're not an HR issue, so. <laughs> Is Jason coming? Jason? Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this is something where uh, one of our residents here, uh, Jack Radner, and I had worked on even as a resident, as a candidate, and then also as a commissioner. So I want to be able to thank everybody, not just the residents, those that are tuning in at home, and all of our wonderful representatives, especially Senator Pizzo here. Um, this is something where, again, as I mentioned, as a resident, I worked very closely uh, with the budget board on, because this was something that was brought to the residents twice. Uh, we feel as if that now more than ever, we have all the information that we can really be able to provide to our residents how we want to be able to pursue um, the next steps here. It's something where we can't be shooting from the hip on before, like we were just putting numbers on the ballot. And we really feel as if we need to have all the concrete information to provide our residents the best possible solution on how we want to proceed forward on. One thing to take into consideration, obviously, for the fact our location, first and foremost, the fact that sea level rise is something that we need to be very considerate of, but this is not always an easy solution. Because as you'll find out today, that there are options that we need to take into consideration as to if there are flooding. What is the best way to be able to tackle this? Is this something that's going to provide all the possible you know, issues that we're dealing with? Solutions to that. So always taking that uh, information all into consideration as well. And additionally, um, just overall the aesthetic of our islands, you know, that's something that a lot of people are looking at this as a solution that we can provide here today. And then additionally, we want to make sure the cost is something that we're looking at, all the things that will be bearing on our residents for our tax base. So today we'll have all the possible, you know, possible representatives to be able to make sure we're assisting in finding those solutions, um, getting all these um, you know, questions answered. And again, next time before it goes to the residents, know that we have all the information, all the representatives to be able to help gear us in the right direction. So thank you again for everyone tuning in, as well as the residents here and all our wonderful representatives uh, attending tonight. So thank you again. And also thank you to uh, Senator Pizzo and then also our staff for helping to facilitate all that information. So thank you. Our, uh, you know, Ralph for doing that for us. So I'll pass it off to our uh, senator and we can be able to go from there. Good evening. 
Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, when I reached out to the to the manager, I think during session, uh, there was a legislation that was passed at the state level that effectively allows FPL to find in an ecumenical manner the areas of greatest need and to, and to underground all those utilities statewide. Years ago, there had been discussions with the old administration here uh, about contracting with uh, with FPL to, to bury lines. My concern was that this would not be bittersweet when we found out that there was an award uh, to make sure that it actually can be used for those purposes. And so I'm, I'm here to, I have two ears and one mouth, so I'm here to listen twice as much as I speak, but I do obviously have a number of questions. And then anything that, that's attended that needs to be <clears throat> addressed at the state level, I leave on Sunday to go back for committee week. So uh, I, I take with us, I appreciate FPL being here. I reached out to you guys uh, early on to the, to the hires up to make sure that that was the case. Also, tomorrow we have a meeting down at the county on 5G. I know you guys have seen a lot of stuff on social media with the spray painting and with the digging and all that stuff. That's obviously of concern, so we're going to be addressing that as well. And then Friday, actually, this is an important meeting for me selfishly. Friday, we have the Director of Emergency Management for Florida coming to our district. They'll be at Biscayne Park uh, on Friday afternoon. You're coming, right? Yes. And really, we want them to come to explain how they're, they're intermediary between FEMA and local cities. So if you guys are paying for disaster relief, uh, we have a, a number of cities, obviously, in Miami-Dade County, but uh, in particular, El Portal and uh, Miami Shores paid several million dollars collectively for disaster recovery, and you know, they're, they're always waiting on FEMA, and very often they have to assume debt uh, to be able to pay for those things. So this all sort of is inextricably intertwined, and um, I just appreciate being here and having everybody here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Thank you all for being here this evening. This is an important evening in the history of the village uh, because this is an issue that's been discussed for a number of years, and we're hoping to really move this forward in terms of making a decision one way or another. Um, the, the agenda for this evening has been to have um, our elected officials give some uh, introductory remarks. They've both been very, very involved intimately on this issue. Uh, I'm going to give just a very basic uh, one-slide uh, PowerPoint uh, regarding this topic, and then I'm going to hand it over to our illustrious Public Works Director, Jose Olivo, sitting straight across from me, who's going to give you a little bit more information on the, on the technical aspects of undergrounding, right? So there's obviously financial aspects, there are aesthetic aspects, there are technical aspects, and he's going to cover that so we get a better sense of what does it mean to underground the utilities. Uh, in addition, we have one of our financial cons consultants, Lourdes Sabadin, sitting next to our acting CFO, Sandra Sifkin. And Lourdes can walk you through what would this mean for the typical home with regard to additional payments that would be incurred. Uh, in between us here, in between the staff members, we have representatives from F uh, FPL, AT&T, and Atlantic Broadband. And so as soon as we're done with our more formal presentation, we're going to open it up to uh, Q&A from the audience, uh, and we'll hand the microphones over to them for them to be able to answer very industry-specific and utility-specific uh, questions that, that you all will have. So with that, if Jose would load just a very basic slide that I've got to cover. I'm just providing a little bit of historical context, because we all know sort of informally and anecdotally that this issue has been discussed in the village for a number of years. Uh, in terms of what's actually transpired, there have been a, a series of referendums, and information has been gathered in the past. So in 2006, voters in North Bay Village approved a general obligation bond for a little bit over $9 million for this purpose. Uh, in 2007, the commission approved a resolution supporting conversion of overhead utilities to undergrounding. A few years after that, the commission went ahead and they authorized the, uh, paying FPNL to do a study to develop a cost estimate, right? So we know that this is going to cost something, but there wasn't necessarily a, a tremendous amount of certainty. And I think it's been discussed for, for quite a while that, you know, numbers have, have fluctuated a little bit. So they tried to pin down a more specific number. FPL provided a number of just a little bit under $4 million. Um, and then more recently what we did is that we actually, uh, uh, Director Olivo, engaged with each of the utilities over the you know, past few months and actually tried to provide uh, or secure as specific as possible estimates for what each of them would cost in terms of the undergrounding. He's going to be covering those numbers a little bit later this evening. Um, but what happened in the very you know, uh, recent months is we actually were able to secure a grant from FEMA for $11 million for the purpose of undergrounding. As you'll see from the estimates that will be provided, that would cover approximately one-third of the cost of doing so. Um, that being said, while one-third means that there's still two-thirds that we need to figure out how to pay for, one-third is not an insignificant amount. Uh, this is certainly a, a record uh, grant for the village. Um, the, the grant program itself from FEMA requires a 25% match. 
Now, the village had done estimates a few years ago that came to a total of $20 million, which we know is actually not sufficient to actually get this done. But that being said, they had, the voters had approved the $9 million. We now have a grant for $11 million. So our grant says that we are in, if we want to move forward, to the tune of $20 million. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jose, who will go a little into greater depth on what does undergrounding even mean. Uh, good evening, and thank you, Mr. Manager. Again, my name is Jose Olivo, Public Works Director for North Bay Village. Uh, and again, Commissioner Strout, thank you. And Senator Pizzo, thank you very much. And to the residents of North Bay Village. Um, basically, uh, just uh, probably before we start, uh, f starting from uh, the manager, I'd like to uh, maybe have each one introduce themselves, uh, different people from the different utilities before I begin this presentation. If we could start with... Hi, good evening. My name is Addis Carilla. I work with External Affairs for Florida Power and Light. Good evening. My name is Shonda Young-Brown. I'm the manager for the Overhead Underground Conversion Program. Good evening. I'm John Lair, and I'm the uh, project manager for uh, the Overhead Underground Conversion. Hello. My name is Orlando Carr. I'm a governmental account manager with Florida Power and Light. Good evening. Crystal Cole, regional director, external and legislative affairs, at and uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Julio Segovia, and I'm the Senior Director of uh, Engineering and Technical Operations for your neighbors here, Atlantic Broken. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mario Araya, Director of Technical Operations for Atlantic Broken. Very good. Thank you. And as as the manager mentioned, I've, I've uh, been able to do a little bit of research and put together a presentation to inform the residents of what what this really all means with regards to undergrounding utilities. So um, let's start with the basics. Uh, it's, you know, typical overhead power, grill, power grid. Uh, the electric distribution system transports electricity from substations to homes and businesses. Uh, you all know that, you know, uh, with this we have uh, tap lines or lateral branches off the feeder lines that run along our streets, neighborhoods, and homes and businesses. Uh, the system also includes transformers, which obviously reduce the voltage that gets to your homes later on. Uh, transformers are, are mounted on poles near the premises for overhead service or in boxes at ground level for underground service. And obviously, uh, from the transformer, electricity enters residents or building through a service drop. That's what we have right now. And here's just a quick schematic with the meter can the over the the pole and the uh, distribution line over the top so uh, that's what we're looking at private property and city property limits when we talk about undergrounding the system now the pole goes away the overhead uh, distribution line goes away we have a, a meter can and everything goes underground to the one and only transformer pad that you see there and we'll talk about that a little bit later How do you do the actual conversion process? Well, the, according to the industry, there's, there's four phases, and we'll go through each one. Phase one is trenching. This is basically, uh, you know, mainline trench is constructed along the roadway to install plastic conduit below roadway grade. Trenching will also take place laterally from the mainline trench to, to connect service from mainline to home utility boxes, okay? Trenching is the construction phase with the greatest disruption to community, okay? You add, also have an, another, there's other trenchless technologies that you can use, which is directional bore. However, that implies additional cost, okay? Um, phase two is the cabling. This is where, you know, basically uh, when, when all the trenching is done, now we have the, the new utility lines in the new conduits, new transformer and utility boxes above ground at utility easements or sidewalks. The utility lines are energized and all home electrical panel meters have been upgraded and ready to receive the service. A phase three, it's called a cut over. And this, trust me, this is new to me when I was doing my research as well. So um, basically this is the, the phase where properties are transferred over from the overhead lines to the new underground service, okay? And the last phase would be the pole removal. When all the properties have been transferred over to the new underground system, these, the overhead systems are de-energized and cables and poles removed. 
If other utilities other than power are hooked up to poles, this process will not take place until all third-party utility companies have removed their overhead lines. Okay? So, um, and that's when we're talking about uh, um, Atlantic Broadband and AT&T. Quickly, uh, just a quick uh, comparison. Overhead utility versus underground utility. Okay? What are the benefits? Let's look at this. Yes, improve aesthetics. Primarily reduces the frequency of outages caused by storms. Reduces the risk of the public coming in contact with live wires down. Tree branches and overhead lines no longer in contact. And, you know, some of you might recognize that photo. That is East Drive in Harbor Island. Okay. What are the disadvantages? There's actually a few of them. Uh, while underground lines experience fewer outages than overhead lines, it is more difficult to find faults on them than overhead lines and can take longer to repair. Underground lines are less capable of dealing with overloads and are more complicated to upgrade or, or modify. Uprooted trees can pull up an, un, an underground system during heavy winds. Underground lines need to connect with above-ground lines at some point in time and can still experience interruption if the underground trans if the above ground transformer substations and other infrastructure goes offline, and, and the last disadvantage, uh, flooding from heavy rain and storm surges from hurricanes can damage underground lines, and repairs cannot be made until water recedes. This mostly applies to coastal areas. Things to consider. For North Bay Village, when undergrounding utilities, okay. Now we're getting a little bit more specific here. Uh, FPO reports that we have approximately 4.9 pole line miles of overhead electrical facilities. The pole line miles are the number of miles where an individual provider of a utility has facilities along roadway corridors. When multiple providers have facilities along a corridor, the number of pole line miles exceed the length of that roadway corridor. North Bay Village has communication lines and, and cable lines on poles as well. So uh, you're, you're talking about uh, three sets of, of, of uh, uh, overhead lines from pole to pole. Okay. The other thing to consider, consider here, so there's a substantial number of utility lines in North Bay Village that are currently located in the rear of properties, okay, in your backyards, thus impacts to areas as a result of construction will be greater and experience longer durations, okay? It's very difficult for accessible, you know, to access these areas. Property easement acquisition may be required. And I say may, you know, I know it probably be shell or will need to be required, you know. <laughs> Every other home may eventually have a transformer box located in an easement in front of their homes. You see a couple uh, pictures there depicting the transformer box and and uh, with some landscaping to help with the uh, um, you know obviously to mitigate some of the appearance of the box and as we continue things to further consider for North Bay Village predicted sea level rise salt water intrusion okay uh, that can affect the the underground system okay increased probability of underground utility conflicts we have new water mains installed now. We have uh, sewer mains that have been repaired. Okay, uh, so the and the other thing that we have there is overhead utility conversion project may take one year to design and a minimum of five years to complete construction with adequate coordination of all agencies involved. And when we say all, we're talking about all three utilities and and permitting agencies that may be involved as well. Okay, so. Um, and that is just, uh, the next one is just a duplication of what I mentioned before. So those to consider, those to be considered in the cost estimation. Okay, so I think uh, obviously the, the cost is driven primarily by the total length of overhead utilities undergrounded and the length of roadways impact that will need to be trenched and restored. Additional costs such as engineering, permitting, serving, construction, administration, and legal fees have been accounted for as a percentage of this cost. And you'll see that in the following slides. The opinion of cost is based on utility contractors digging trench and installing the electrical and communications infrastructure 
and the village performing trench restoration to control the cost and schedule, okay? Cost for easement acquisition is not included in the estimate you'll, so you'll soon see. The opinion of cost considers the government adjustment factor waiver, which provides municipalities a credit of 25% towards the otherwise applicable cost of FPL conversion per the FPL tariff. This benefit is a recognition of the avoided storm recovery costs that would otherwise be incurred if such facilities were constructed in an overhead configuration. The savings is passed on to the customer who is making the improvement in accordance with the tariff. However, the discount may not apply entirely if a designated conversion area is not ready to be energized within six months of undergrounding. So basically, uh, this is a summary of uh, more or less the cost of conversion, okay, for each utility. For FPL, you know, we have a, a load uh, there's a load to a high range from 16.9 million to 19 million, okay? For Atlantic, Atlantic Broadband, it's 5.4 million to 6.1 million. And for AT&T, it's 7 million to 7.9 million. So when we add all these up, we're looking at a range between 29.3 million to $33 million to do this job, okay? And following, this is the detailed breakdown of costs for each utility that I was able to come up with. Um, FPL provided us with their straight conversion cost of 5.219 uh, million, okay? And I furthermore went into estimating what that would cost, which is pavement milling and resurfacing. You're looking at 2.96 million. Roadway utility trench restoration, assuming we do a th three foot wide trench, 2.39 million. Private property connection and electrical upgrades. This applies to single family units. Required panel work on private properties to receive underground service plus permits with building department, two million and $60,000, okay? Um, so you're looking at a subtotal right there of $12 million, uh, $630,000 and change. And then we have the other items, uh, which is basically a percentage of cost of that $12 million, $630,000 and change, which we have engineering survey for $1.2 million, construction administration for $252,000 and change, construction inspection for $631,000, legal fees at $52,000, and the FPO credit that I've accounted for. So you're looking at $13 million, $524,000 and change. So. With that number, what I basically did is um, assume the 25% contingency over for, the, for that first year, assuming we, we go to five years to finish this job. So the grand total for year one is $16.9 million. In the span of five years, you know, we're looking at the range would be up to $19 million, okay? So this is FPL alone, and the same process is is done for um, Atlantic Broadband, okay? Except some of these costs are, are are not included because we're already accounting for them in the FPO cost, okay? For example, you're not going to have roadway pavement milling and resurfacing again, okay? And the they they will have a separate three foot wide uh, uh, roadway utility uh, because their Atlantic Broadband and AT and T in accordance with my discussions, they're not sharing the same trench with FPL for 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 reasons uh, when they have to go in and do any kind of repairs, upgrades. They don't want to damage the other utilities that are that, are, that might be in the way. Uh, so again, we go through the same scenario here, and I'm looking at a a, a cost, a range for year one, grand total of 5.4 million dollars. Mm -hmm to $6.1 million, okay? And the same goes for AT&T, okay? Uh, I'm looking at a range here uh, anywhere for year one from $7 million to $7.9 million. So basically, um, it goes back to the entire summary. So um, with that, I now want to uh, pass the presentation on to uh, Ms. Abadin, who's going to tell you 
more or less the financing, how we would go about to finance this project, and then we'll open it up for questions for the public. Thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to um, shed some light as to what does this really mean financially? What is the impact of um, this project to all the homeowners? So you have a decision to make, I guess, it, which is first, do we want the undergrounding? And then one of the components is, you know, how much is this going to cost me? And, and to figure out if it's worth it for you. So um, we looked at various things. Tell me how to. Um, thank you. So we looked at various things when we were studying. Um, how much this would cost and how it would impact the individual homeowner. So we, we, um, we were provided low and high estimates from um, the various utilities and the municipality as a whole. So you see this here as a project cost. So we're going to show you the, both the low and the high estimates. Um, minus the grants received, which are the $11 million dollars, so the cost, the project financing that you would need to seek would be 17.6 million or 21.2 million. We assume that we would borrow this money over 30 years, and the interest rate, the overall interest rate, including all the costs of financing, etc., would be at 3.16 percent. This is a very um, a very lucrative time to borrow money because we are in an all-time low interest rate environment. So this helps um, the cost of the financing. The average annual debt service for the village as a whole would run anywhere between $935,000 to $1.124 million a year. And the total debt service, including interest and principal over the 30 years, is between 27 and a half to 33 million dollars. Thank you. <laughs> so what does that mean to you? So here we have the we have the estimate, the low and the high estimate. We assumed uh, we we took a look at what is the assessed value of the of North Bay Village currently, and according to the debt that we think we're going to need to issue and the interest rates assumed, we figured out that that was going to uh, incur an additional millage of 70, 0.79 on the low end or 0.95 on the high end. Now, what is a millage? A millage is a measurement by which you are taxed on your property taxes per $1,000 of the value of your home. So I made, put an example here. So if you're, the cost of your home is $100,000, this would mean a yearly taxable, a, a year, an additional yearly tax of anywhere between $80 and $96, low and high end. And over the 30 years, if, for every $100,000 value of your property, you're talking 2.4 million to 2 point, I mean, sorry, Two, $2,400, a little extra zeros there, to $2,900 over the 30 years. This only would happen if you lived in your home for the next 30 years. So if you want to do, okay, thank you. <laughs> Wait, let me finish here. So, and here's a formula, and I put this formula so that you can figure out for yourself based on your home. So the formula would be you take the assessed value of your home, you multiply it times this 0.7991 or 0.9585 to get a low or a high value. You divide that by 1,000 since that is the fee per $1,000 of taxable value of your home, and that would be your annual cost of undergrounding the utilities. Now. Assessed value is not the same thing as market value. Market value is what you would sell your home for. Assessed value is the value that the county utilizes to impose property taxes on your home. So that includes, for some of you, homestead exemption, veterans exemptions, etc. So if you're not sure about what your assessed value is, this is a website that you can go to. You might want to jot this down. And if you go to this website, 
you will find a place to enter your home address, and when you enter your home address, you will see all the details of your property taxes, including the assessed value of your property tax of your home. Now, as time goes by, your, the assessment value of your homes will increase. We took a very conservative estimate, and we only assumed that your assessed values would grow at 1% per year. Over the last five years, the lowest growth of assessment values for the village have been almost 5%. So as you can see, this is a very conservative estimate. At the beginning, you're going to be paying the 0.7991 or 0.985 or somewhere in between. But as you, the assessed value of your properties increase, that number goes down on an annual basis for the, until the year 30 where you see you're now at 0 0.60 or 0.7277. This is what the property taxes look like for the residents of North Bay Village. So as you know, the property taxes that you pay are not just for the village. You pay taxes for the county, you pay taxes for the children's trust, the school millage, regional millage, and then the orange portion is what you pay for the municipality. The portion, this would, have, this would include, if you were to go forward with this project, the yellow portion would be the portion that would be related to the undergrounding of the utilities. So for this scenario, which we used a $100,000 assessed value, the annual property tax payment, including the electric underground utilities, your whole property tax would be $2,270. That's the low estimate. I keep doing the wrong one. The high estimate would be similar. $2,285 a year. And you can see again the portion that of your taxes that would be related to the undergrounding of the utility. And I think with that I will close and open it up to any questions. So thank you very much to everyone. Take name and okay. for the record. Luis I live in 7611 Santa Bay Drive. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad that the new administration and the new commissioners were able to develop this thing and give us the opportunity to look at, at a project that I believe is very important. And I have several questions for several people. So the first would be, I hear you saying that and a lot of people say that the flooding it can damage the underground lines, and also at the south water, especially with the sea level vibration, it will damage the lines. Well, they are like underground lines right now that goes all over the oceans, you know, and it's been there for years, for decades, and they last many, many years. So when I see stuff like that, for me, it's like excuses, okay? Because if you do it properly, that thing is going to stay there for a long time, in my opinion. So, so I just want to, you guys can develop on that. I mean, what is the, the expected life of an underground line? Um, John Lair, Florida Power and Light. Um, that was a great comment. Um, as you can see from the mainland, um, you don't, we don't have any overhead lines. Um, probably the subaqueous cable that's coming across is probably 30 plus years that's in the ground. Um, the way we design our systems, whether it's overhead or underground, um, the equipment should last at least 30 years. And <clears throat> if you do move forward with the underground, 
Um, all the maintenance and everything would be on FPL, so you would pay that initial up front, and then all the maintenance would be on our side. Okay. So I guess what is most subject to, like, damage? Flooding, for example, will be a transformer because they're going to be on the street? Um, I wrote it down. Uh, typically what happens in our underground systems, and the other utilities can say it, um, are dig-ins. When p someone doesn't um, call for locates, um, that causes us the most uh, problems when they have a dig-in. Um, with respect to the water and the transformers, um, like you said, I mean, we have the subaqueous crossings that have been in the water forever. Um, regarding the transformers, <clears throat> um, probably after Irma, um, we got a lot of push from probably a lot of the util or a lot of municipalities here from the south, um, and we came up with a um, what we call a storm pad. Uh, our typical transformer. Uh, is on a six inch concrete pad and the transformer sets on that and in areas that um, the cities deem as flood prone um, we now have a 24 inch pad um, that we would put the transformer on top to give that extra um, elevation for you know keeping it out of the water okay just to give everybody on the perspective I've been living here for 15 years and I live in Norway Island and when we got all the hurricanes, I stay in every single hurricane, so I can tell, because I went to the street right after or in the middle of the storm, we barely get like one, one, two feet, that's it. That's the situation. Many people are going to speculate. Right. I don't speculate because I live through that. Right. Well, we have, um, just to the north of you, we, we actually have a, a city that went one step further, and they actually did an elevation study of the, um, the area to convert. And they came back to us and recommended that, you know, they're going to put in those 24-inch pads in those low areas. Okay. So the same option would be for the city here. So that will prevent from flooding and probably will, <coughs> assuming well, that the sea level uh, continue to go up, I mean, it will provide more time for, correct. for additional let, upgrading. Let me just way. address the uh, flooding. Um, <coughs> Jose was correct that once the uh, the area is, is flooded, um, FPNL won't um, enter to repair or restore service until the water has receded, and that is basically for overhead and underground. It's not just underground. Okay, so overhead is the same. So okay. if it's flooded, FPL is not going to be there, even if you have the overhead. The water has to recede in order to get there. Okay, so that's a good point also to point, because when I see stuff like that in presentations, and I've been like an advocate for this thing because we voted like a long time ago, and when I see stuff like this, it's mm -hmm. like excuses. Mm -hmm. And I live in Norway Island again. I know that some of the, in Treasure Island, you get flooding and stay there for hours, maybe days. In Norway Island, that thing goes away in hours. After the storm goes, boom, that's it, finished. So just for everybody to also to think about, I don't know about the other islands, because... I mean, I know Treasure Island because I drove through that after the last hurricane. Okay. And I guess the same thing goes by for AT&T and, and the cable company, right? It's the same. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I guess with you guys also, when the new de technology with the G5, so most likely like physical deployment of, of wiring is going to be obsolete in a few years, and we're probably going to get all the communication through G5s instead of like uh, the cable, right? So because I'm thinking maybe looking at that, if I'm looking at, uh, at the right way, I say, I you're going to keep the, the other two when the technology comes in two, three years or five years, that's it. We don't need it anymore. So we don't need to underground all the utilities. Maybe we just need to underground the power. That's an idea. You know, thinking about how the technology is moving. That may, be an op that may be something that may happen, no? I don't think you have to wait five years. I think yeah, no. Probably for ten million dollars, you pull now. like G, probably for ten million dollars, you can deploy deploy G five in Norway village that even the pen, Pentagon will not have it. But anyway, those are, those are ideas. You know, you have to think about that way. In my opinion, okay. I got more questions. Sorry. Okay. Also, what is I know that you mentioned like five years, the project itself. Five years is also considering the five miles 
uh, or for example, if we decide just to underground certain areas of the city, would that be also five years because of the coordination or, or it may be a shorter time? No, and, and speaking to, to you know, FPL, which has the, has the, the bulk of the work, uh, we were just trying to establish a timeline. And it's five years to do the whole thing, so to speak. Okay. For the city. So we need yes. to do half of the city, maybe half of the time. Uh, yeah, of course. More. Of course. So, but it'll take at least, that's a minimum, okay, so to speak, with good coordination. Okay, so. But we have you, so. Well, uh, good uh, you. <laughs> it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't depend on me because I'm not a property owner. So that's what I'm, I'm saying. We got to coordinate with every property owner there is to get this done block by block perhaps uh and and the, and that can that can hinder the entire project set it back delay it so there there's there's a lot of things that come in you know that that have to you know that are going to be working at the same time and we got to figure out hey may, is it just one block is it two blocks is it the whole village is it a section but uh i, I can't pinpoint it nor can FPL. Yeah. okay so there was also like a, a comments from many residents that are, that oppose this thing. Even the citizens, we approved it like twice already. Last, the first one like ten years ago. Uh, they also say that if one resident doesn't want to disconnect from the main line, they have to maintain the the power line. Is that true? <clears throat> the way, if if you follow the GAF tariff that um, Jose had, um, there is a provision in there. Um, when we provide that 25% up front, um, we're basically looking in the future and saying, okay, um, instead of, of sending an army of troops in here overhead to get everybody restored, um, we work 24 hours, 24 seven. And so we could send, if you were underground, we could send one individual in here to troubleshoot at night and probably get the island up if it could. Um, so that's why the teeth in that tariff is um, all the all the residents within the conversion area uh, must convert to the new underground system. Um, however, it, there is a provision in there. If there's one individual that um, doesn't want to convert, um, there's a provision, I think it's $789, where we'll come out of an underground transformer, run up the pole, and keep their service at their resident on the overhead side. The only problem with that is, um, for that resident, is we restore based on the majority, you know, we go for the largest restoration. If that one individual is the only one in the community that hasn't, you know, gone underground and is out of power, we can almost guarantee they're going to be out for the, till the, the last day of the restoration. Uh, they, he probably deserve it, or she. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Um. Sorry, let me get a normal questions. Uh, and I know you've probably been like in many uh, meetings like this. Uh, what is that, especially for FPNL, what is like the general, uh, as a corporate level, what is the general consensus or, or comments uh, when it comes to like global, warm, global warming that will increase the frequency of the storms? That's what they say, or at least they, what they're trying to sell us on the TV. And also we have the sea level rising. rising. And here we have water like four feet down. I mean, it's trench, four feet, um, probably now it's even three or whatever. So is that like a good ad idea for Costa? Because we're a Costa community. Is that a good idea in general? Or, or is something that was approved in general in Tallahassee? And, but I mean, the reality is not good for, for communities like this. It's like if we were to build the city right now, Will will be forced to do it that way, or the better the better way will be to have the the overhead uh, lines. Well, um, currently today we're an overhead company, so we have a tariff that if a developer wants to come in and develop a piece of land, um, we have an underground tariff where there's certain costs, the differential costs that you would have to pay overhead versus underground. Mm -hmm. um, however. With all the new technology that we're putting in on the overhead system, those two costs, um, the overhead and the underground are coming close to each other. So we're actually filing for um, a new tariff um, 
at the end of uh, coming up here in the next month or whatever. Um, and it's probably going to be um, that underground tariff is those developers won't have to uh, pay for that underground cost. So we'll become an underground company versus an overhead today. Okay. Even for coastal communities like ours. Even for coastal, for everyone. And just uh, on, that, on that end, what will be, uh, you've been in many presentations and there have been some cities around us that they uh, actually did the conversion some time ago. They approved it after we did it, but they did it before. Uh, like Sunny Isles, Sunny Isles, I believe, is one of them. What, why, what is your sense? Why did they do it? You know, why they went <laughs> through it? Because it's like a process, five years of trenching. It's like a nightmare, you know. Uh, but why do they decide to, to do it, in your opinion, to go through the issues and pay and why? Well, the main reason that, um, and I've been, in, I've been doing it since 2006, since the beginning So you've been here GM. before? I've been here a few times. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, the main reason that folks underground is for aesthetics, okay? Um, let's face it, you know, people don't want to see the wires. However, um, there is a benefit, and the benefit is the system becomes more reliable um, from that aspect of it. And um, there are two communities that, as you said, um, you know, undergrounded back in 2008, 2010 timeframe. And I think it was the storm Matthew that came towards the coast of West Palm and then went up and hit the Daytona Beach area. Um, there's two communities that um, they undergrounded and with that, you know, I think it was 80 mile an hour wind or whatever, they didn't lose they didn't lose power in their community, and they're on, on the coast. It I will cry. That happened in Norway Village. I will cry of <laughs> happiness. Um, <laughs> there's actually uh, that would be Jupiter Inlet Colony and Jupiter Island to the north. So basically, just for everybody that is, because you cannot imagine how many how many people like no because of this or this or this. So generally speaking, the system is more stable. And most likely, we're gonna have a better. Uh, 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 we're going to have a more stable system. Mm -hmm. And when the floating, and it's really nice that what you said, because I didn't know, it really doesn't matter. If it's flooded, you're not going to fix either the under underground or the overhead. So overall, the system is going to be better. So now I want to go to the finance. I'm okay with that. Now with the finance. <laughs> because when you, and I'm going to pick out your last line. Line. Uh, line. And the line was because people don't want to see the power lines. What, like people want to have a nice phone, a nice car, the design. So ugliness brings cheaper, brings uh, value properties down. So it's nicer. People are willing to pay more money for the house. I mean, I'm surprised. Like where I live, like they pay like a million dollars, and you get out and you see like a, like you know, the trash can hanging. It's like you know, I put like plenty of street that I don't see it. But, uh, but the reality does bring me now to the finance. How much was like, the financing cost right now? Probably cheaper right now because the Fed lowered the interest rate 25 basis points, so probably that will go lower a little bit. Uh, and most likely, since we're getting into a recession, we even get a like, lower interest rate going forward in the next year or two years. But that's not my question. That's a reality. How much was the cost for something like this like 10, 15 years ago? Probably the cost of undergrounding was cheaper, but the cost of financing was more expensive. But please keep in mind that municipal bonds are not priced off the Fed funds rate. I know, but they are priced off the uh, municipal market. Yeah, but but it, everything is related. I also do finance, so everything is related. Interest goes down, mortgages go down, corporate financing goes down. Then you pay six percent for bonds of a crappy company that before you were asking like twelve percent. But in general, it was cheaper, even though now it's more expensive, but it's cheaper. So at the end of the day, when you consider this, you don't consider the cost. You consider the cost and the financing cost associated. So we're getting a break right now. So anybody knows what is like the assess, the assess, the average or the median assessed value of uh, the homes in, in the island? 279000 So let's say $300,000. So you're saying, basically, in your calculation, that if we go through this nightmare, 
all taxes are going to go up for like $95 for every $100,000. For the high end. Or the high end will be, let's go crazy, a hundred bucks a year. Uh, for $300,000 of a home, so you'll have to spend $300 a year. So around 25 bucks a month. So assuming that you are a financial person, so assuming that your home in the next five years, let's assume five years, so you do all this stuff and you spend $300, $300 a year, by five years, $1,500. So assuming that your home, because the look, city looks better, you, have, you don't see that crappy lines and now they're gonna repay, because this is also important. When we do this thing, then we have brand new streets. So assuming we do all of these things, if your home goes up for like $5,000, it's a killing. You're making, it's a great investment. You invest $300 a year, and then five years down the road, you make $5,000. I'm willing to invest on that stuff. So that's, more or less, it makes sense what I'm saying, right? More or less, no? That's from crystal the ball material. <laughs> from, the po from, the co from the financing point of view and... So that's my comment. I know a lot of people are going to be blah, 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 like we've been having for 10 years. It's their turn. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. Good evening, everyone. James Rosenberg, 7521 Cutlass Avenue. Uh, that gentleman lives on North Bay Island. I live on Treasure Island, and the experience in terms of flooding is quite a bit different. We have seen instances where we've had a couple of feet of water standing in the street for an extended period of time. And uh, yeah, there's no question that the water table is just beneath the surface. We, so, we, you know, perhaps we presently have a more dire resiliency issue on Treasure Island than North Bay Island, although really it's just a matter of opinion. My bigger issue is that having been involved uh, for many years in dealing with um, government-related capital improvement projects of large scale, my concern is that although we've got a range of cost that has been established, and it's not insignificant even with these estimates, um, more often than not as time passes, and we discover things as we start digging, these estimates prove to be untrue and additional things come to light and the costs tend to increase. So my fear is that although these are the best estimates that you can provide today, I don't feel at all comfortable that these estimates will hold true over the long term. and. Um, the $33 million high end could easily turn into a $50 million high end. Um, we've seen instances of things like this happening before, and it's not because anyone has, is doing anything incorrectly. It's, it's what we don't know. And it's, you know, and there usually are clauses built into contracts for unforeseen conditions, mm -hmm. right? And that often leads to cost escalation. So my concern is these numbers are probably not going to be as reliable as we would like them to be. So I think that the cost that you're projecting for the typical household are likely to be uh, higher in the end. And, uh, and let's take it a step further. We've just put a lot of effort and, and time into going through a very detailed resiliency exercise here, right? I, and although I must say that I had been a proponent of, of going underground with the lines, I don't quite feel the same way anymore. And I'm more concerned about doing something like this only to turn around and find that we, we probably should have coupled it with our efforts to take care of the resiliency problem. You know, we see all the, everything behind us here that calls for the need to elevate all of these structures. And that involves a tremendous amount of infrastructure. It seems to me that it would make a lot more sense to couple 
this underground or shall I say non-overhead utility effort with that because that's ideally situated to deal with the sea level rise issue. Um, and let's face it, folks, we have been very fortunate not to have been hit by the type of hurricane that can easily put us six feet, eight feet underwater. Um, it could happen. It, we've just been very lucky that it hasn't. And it, even going from a six-inch concrete pad to a 24-inch concrete pad, you know, it provides a little bit of relief, but it's not even anything close to a longer-term solution. And if we're going to spend this kind of money, I just think that we need to think longer-term because it's a tremendous effort that's going to be required. It's going to be highly inconvenient. And the inconvenience is only worth it if we're going to end up with a true solution that benefits everyone. And there are other things involved, too. Uh, on Treasure Island, you have easements for the for all the lines that are in the rear of the property. Um, that's not just a matter of inconvenience. That's a structural issue for some of us, too. Uh, you know, because in some instances, we've built things like patios and pools that are rather close to the easement line. And, and even though those things may not be permitted if you were to build them new today, they're there. And so what's going to happen? You're going to have to bring heavy equipment in there to dig up all this stuff and not only do you want one three-foot trench, you now want two three-foot trenches. Boom, you're now into my swimming pool. So I don't see that as a viable solution either. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. But any, anyway, so all I'm suggesting to you is, is it a good idea? Yes, but. And the big but is we've got to take care of of this resiliency issue before we think about potentially sinking fifty million dollars or so into this project because I think that's where we're likely to be. Let me give you a perfect e example of what happens with escalation. Um, I don't know if you followed the numbers that the county has had to deal with in terms of, of repairing and remediating problems with its water and sewer system. Those numbers have gone incredibly higher and, you know, it's not that anyone has done anything bad. It's just that once you get started, there are so many things that haven't been considered that I think that I have. I'm just urging everyone to be extremely cautious about this. Thank you very much. I'll make one comment. Um, with, with reference to the undergrounding, um, moving forward, everything would be would be moved to the front so in some cases um, some cities abandon that easement in the rear up so all the utilities would be placed in the front Jack Ratner 7611 Beachview Drive coincidentally the same 7611 just on the water side as the gentleman who spoke first who's in the center of North Bay Island uh, I've lived there for almost 50 years. Like a lot of, a lot of homeowners and residents here, uh, their homes are very old. Uh, they haven't been updated. I know some neighbors still have the old panels, in, the fuse panels in their house with the screw fuses. Uh, I'm fortunate I already have underground utilities as all the homes do on the water on North Bay Island. Uh, but those are connected with a handhold box uh, between the two properties in the easement, which currently, unless something has changed, and that's my question, um, you, unless you get permission from the city for the easement to put the transformers in the easement, they have to go on the private property. Is that correct? I mean, that's from the FPL website. That's why I ask. Um, with reference to the um, governmental adjustment wa wager factor, um, the program that the city of North Bay Village is um, venturing in, um, there is what we call a right-of-way agreement in lieu of um, an easement. And basically, it allows <coughs> FPL to place 
some of its facilities within that right of way as long as um, the teeth in the agreement is if anything needs to be relocated in the future for any reason it would be at the city's cost so uh, okay because typically as you as you have on the FPL website correct the property use agreements uh, you like to have be able to put it on the owner's properties correct and you want that unanimous when you can get it like for instance Treasure Island where mr. Rosenberg lives the right-of-way ends at the inside edge of the sidewalk then it is all homeowners property it's private property and I know the the engineering that was done the first time around was calling for all the undergrounding to go through everyone's private property on the front yards anyone correct me if I'm wrong that said no to that and then you and you can make a stable a grid has to then go out into the street correct uh, to bypass which correct. of course then we lose the tariff discount and it gets more expensive to all those homes that we have to go around because everyone on Treasure Island it's all going to be trenched through the private property <clears throat> again um, we're trying to encourage the undergrounding so that's why we came up with that right-of-way agreement it was basically after the 2004 2005 storm seasons um, that we heard two things from the cities or the municipalities we heard number one undergrounding is is too expensive so we um, came up with the the GAF program the 25 percent up front for those uh, eligible projects um, moving forward and then the other the second item is um, just as you said um, FPNL is too rigid with respect to requiring easements so in order to encourage um, these cities to try and do more of undergrounding um, for the city projects um, under this program they're they're able to to uh, sign this right-of-way agreement that allows us to place some of the facilities within that right-of-way in lieu of an easement all right what I what we all and thank you what we keep talking about and thank you Commissioner Strout we worked on this for a couple of years to no avail because this this is an old project as Louis Torrego said uh, this has been going on since just after Wilma uh, oh, 05. 05 and that's yeah. when this all started in 2004 06. 05 right um, seawalls everything else that uh, mm -hmm. was a disaster particularly on West Treasure Drive all the people that lost seawalls everyone else like me we're faced with that now uh, in the figures that you're talking about for the new general obligation bond you and I got the chance to talk and you said you were figuring five thousand um, dollars to cover expenses to the property owners for the conversion correct mr. Olivo yes average okay. average yes um, some of us uh, are not as fortunate that still have old breaker panels old meter cans on the sides of our homes um, everyone who is not on the water has the meter can like you did in the illustration on the side going up the riser above ground what I just learned I just went through this personal experience is my meter can box which was original from 1965 was now defective had to be replaced uh, that was a six-month process waiting until the last week uh, for FPL which is just bogged down with all the work to do the cutover my expense to just replace the meter can had to raise it up on the riser um, with the electrician and the permits was $5,100 I already have my riser and underground of course I don't have a trench and the new uh, PVC pipe so it, it's the old cloth wiring that is exposed underground that I would have to say the bulk of the homeowners here have the last engineering diagrams was going to move the handhold box uh, to the south side of my property which would have required me who already has underground to dig a trench from the new location 
And if it was in the current location, I have to do directional boring because of the poured concrete patio, which let's add to $5,000. The estimates are between eight and $12,000. That's to the homeowner. What everyone has to understand when we're talking about these 30 million in GO bonds, $5,000 is all that the GO bond is going to cover for the homeowner who is going to be financially responsible to do all of the trenching at their home. They are, every homeowner here is going to have to put in to code the new meter can box with the shutoffs outside, which is important uh, in, in the event that the fire department has to cut off the power to your house. Got to have it. Um, beyond that, I then learned from code enforcement as we we're going through this, when you're replacing the old meter can and you have the old cloth wiring to your house, going into the electrical, and if anyone, and John, you seem to, you've been dealing with this the longest with us, the old cloth wiring from the meter can outside to the breaker panels, code enforcement says, now you've got to replace that. Correct. Electrician, that's an added cost. Oh, you're going to an old breaker panel. That old breaker panel needs to be up to code because you're changing the connection from the meter can. You have to replace that with a new panel to code. Uh, I was then told that the wiring that goes from the new breaker panel is old wiring and it's only single pole, so I got to pull extra, extra wiring from the panels and to the sub-panels. Well, most of us with the old homes, that means there is no conduits for the old homes built prior to, I'd say, the early 80s. They're all, it's all stapled up in your rafters. So there's no conduit. I got to pull apart my ceilings to be able to put in new wiring to every outlet, every switch, every light. Um, for me, and for most homeowners here, you start getting into, and I've gotten the estimates from electricians, uh, uh, renovators, we're up into over $100,000 if I were to have to bring my home up to code. Wow. That's my home, and my home was built in 65. I can't imagine the homes that were built before that. But everyone, you know, we keep talking about it. Would it be wonderful to not lose power as we do on North Bay Island? I don't know about Treasure Island. The wind blows, we lose power. Uh, uh, just recently, we lost power. There was no storm. It was, uh, and I don't know if, if this affected my neighbor here, uh, we lost power on a Saturday at 1030 because of an underground fuse, which I think was on Harbor Island, which feeds to North Bay Island, correct? We get uh, the power from Harbor? I'm not familiar with the local area. Okay. Um, the... We kept getting delays on when the power was going to be restored. Eventually, before 9 o'clock that night, it was restored. But personally, in speaking with the crews who explained what the underground fuse is, for lack of a, a better word, as they explained it to me, was the underground crews, like you said, the one guy who can come out and work on the underground, is in short supply compared to, as FPL is an above-ground company, He's already otherwise engaged. So it was that, you know, let's say 10 hours, 8 to 10 hours before he got out to be able to do it because the above ground crew cannot work on the underground. Is that correct? You're all shaking your head. Yes. It's a cable. Uh, so, the, you know, in the ground. Um, I can tell you after Irma, my handhold box still had water in it. So it was. It was uh, more than two weeks before I could be energized because I was underground. A little different than the pad, but I can tell you, for, for me, I have natural gas lines. I had a generator until Irma took it out, which has run my whole house um, without a problem. It certainly seems to me when everyone in North Bay Village understands that it's beyond the $100 let's say on the high side, per $100,000 of assessed value, if somebody's involved with tens of thousands of dollars to bring their home up to code to replace electrical panels, 
to do the uh, underground conduits, replace their, I, I mean, tens of thousands of dollars to a lot of people is something that is going to make it cost prohibitive, which I believe in the past when everyone voted in favor of it, many of us were unaware, even through all the workshops, how much the property owner is going to be responsible for. $5,000 on the GO bond, I, I mean, isn't going to cut it. And I can tell you, everyone, when you think about this, if it makes it onto the ballot, if you've got an old breaker panel that hasn't, I think the new code, the new panels was about six years ago, the latest panels. I know you guys aren't code enforcement, but um, if you've got the old screw-in uh, fuses, if you've got panels that are even over 10 years old, you haven't done renovations to your house, when this happens, you're going to have to do those upgrades. As it says on the website, you will get involved, the homeowner, with bringing things up to code. I mean, and, and it's there. Anyone, I, I would just uh, encourage everyone to go to fpl.com uh, forward slash reliability forward slash underground hyphen conversions forward slash faq.html. FPL has explained it very well. It's just the dollars. Everyone has to remember the dollars that the homeowner spends beyond what we're now adding, 5000 per household, every homeowner is going to be responsible for. You're going to be responsible to pay out of pocket for the trench, the meter can, all the upgrades to your home. And if that's tens of thousands of dollars, as Mr. Torrego asked, if somebody says no, you then have to leave it, those above ground lines, even in my case, the, um, the underground uh, uh, cloth wiring. You have to leave it, correct? If, if one, you know, it, it's up to the municipal to um, get all the, the folks to convert. And if that one individual um, refuses to do it, the city would have to pay the 789 and we'd stick a pole in the ground and keep the overhead wire hot mm -hmm. to their house. And, and in doing so, that would mean then they said, I, just, I don't want any underground utility. And, and there will be more than one customer, we know, because who can afford um, thousands and thousands of dollars? If, if, if they got a $25,000 on the low side, to upgrade their home to accept the underground utilities. They say, I can't pay it, leave it. Leave my, my cable TV with Atlantic Broadband, leave my AT&T telephone, leave my electric. It's all three of those utilities that would have to still be fed by the pole, correct, everyone? Yes. Let me just say this. Um, I've been doing this since 2006, mm -hmm. and I've probably done 50, 70 projects. And for all those projects, we never had to implement that area where the city um, couldn't get everyone to convert. We've never had to go in there and put a pole and leave somebody overhead. Some way, somehow, the city figures it out to get that person converted. You've been dealing with North Bay question here because I see what Jack is getting at. But in your, oh, well, and, and, and I'm yeah. going yeah. to finish up and let you, you, you go. The, the, okay. uh, but again, the big thing is um, on Treasure Island, all of the undergrounding, all of the trenching has got to be through the private property before we even talk about, and you have to get that approval for the trenching from everyone. If I may, Mr. Berger, I'm sorry, just oh, one no, second. That's fine. Okay. Uh, and I'm, those of you who know me know that I'm very transparent and very straightforward. Let me tell you why I was excited about this meeting, okay? Because this, prior, this past legislative session, we gave FPL full authority to go triage all 412 municipalities, find out where the areas of greatest need and outages are, and you can bill us all ecumenically, all 21,700,000 of us, ecumenically bill us, so you can go underground everywhere and bill it proportionally across the entire state. I was excited about this meeting because I wanted to see, with working within the four corners of the $11 million grant, whether or not this could accelerate and bring North Bay Village up to the front of the line. Having said that, several months ago when I engaged with the city manager and, and Mr. Mayor, 
was to discuss where they were in negotiations with FPL several years ago for undergrounding. And this $11 million in anticipation coupling with what is soon to be, I know it has to go through rulemaking, coupled with your ability to find areas of greatest need in triage. If you tell me Panama City is the, the worst area in, in, of all 412, followed by uh, West Palm Beach, followed by North Bay Village is number three on the list. Whether or not someone's going to lose their place in the, in the list or not have to pay if you're able to put North Bay Village on the list. I don't agree with the finances. I wouldn't pay that. That's out of control. However, I would pay for a single family house if he really told me there was a guaranteed maximum price of $2,875 to go from overhead to underground, I'd pay it. Because I think if I went to go sell my house one day and someone had the option between house A overhead and house B underground, hopefully the lights are on the day that the broker's showing the house and I would pay the $2,875. But Mr. Ratner's right about basically a guaranteed maximum price. And I know you guys do guaranteed maximum price, right? On contracts, never? No. Never. That's got to change. That's something that I need to see that, that we definitely change. So you can guarantee a maximum price. The tariff that they're talking about. Um, it's for underground. Right, it's for underground. However, um, let's just say we give them a, a price of a million bucks. The, the tariff allows us to go after the project is built, we're allowed to get uh, go back and ask for 10% more. Understood. But you, you understand this last session that we all voted on was to allow you to go underground all of Mexico Beach and actually North Bay, Village, North Bay Village residents are paying for that in their monthly bill. You understand that, right? Well, we don't handle Mexico Beach. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I just want to be clear about, about this point, that there, yep. there may come a time, it may not be conveniently tomorrow, Correct. next year, or 15 years from now, but at some point, FPL actually will put all of this in for free, correct? At some point in the future, all 412 municipalities will have FPL undergrounding at no cost. So homeowners still have to grant easements. So that still doesn't address the easement question because if the homeowner says no, then for example, we have a pilot today that we have modeled after what we anticipate the, um, the, the rulemaking will model for the, the priority. And today when we approach that, um, those neighborhoods of need, if there's 70 homeowners on that lateral, did you say uh, uh, home, uh, um, homeowners of mean? No, need. 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 Okay. need. So so based on reliability, yeah. we approach that neighborhood, and if it's 70 homeowners and one homeowner says, no, I'm not going to give you an easement, then FPL has to move on. So we will not underground if we can't get the easements. So that's that's one particular point that we need to, I you mean. Need, you need 100%, you need 100% acquiescence order to underground any project area. That's under the current. Under the current. We've we, we modeled the pilot based, based on what we anticipate the rulemaking rules to be. So we don't know what the rules are at this point. At the same time, that's only FPL. So the other utilities can remain on the polls and the polls will stay. I'm right. specifically talking about that. I just want to take it just piece by okay. piece. I, mean, I don't mean any disrespect. We've spent so many hundreds of hours on all this stuff between Tallahassee and here. At some point in the future, between at some point in the future between October 30th, 2019, and when my sons are sending me checks because they have jobs 30 years from now, <laughs> FPL, based on the legislation that was passed, is actually going to, and I don't mean to say at no cost because we're all going to bear the cost, but your next undergrounding project, the way that it's scheduled with what just passed last session, is that the residents of Mexico Beach may get undergrounding and a couple pennies are going to be added to everybody's FPL bill here in Miami-Dade County to pay for that project because at some point, as you go down the line of triage and the list of all municipalities in Florida, we're going to get around to your city, too, where you don't have to pay for it. That's what I voted right, for. Right. That's why I'm asking the question. I so, that I vote for. Right, but the rules don't say it's one city at a time. It may be one circuit at a time. So, it, so over, over a 30, 40, 50 year time period, there is an opportunity that if we underground, we can seek recovery. That's what it says. So let me go back to just real quick. I'm Mr. Ryan, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you No, no. So what I'm excited about was, was, listen, if we have this, that train's left the station and FPL can start 
doing underground projects, and we can get utility companies like AT and T to maybe consider uh, co-locating and not cost North Bay Village another two point nine million dollars. But if the FEMA money can only be used for particular types of projects or locating or undergrounding, but FPL is already there, and this is some of the discussions I want to have, which is. Is there a policy that if there's an area where you're already trenching and someone's already uh, d trenching for something else, will you guys co-locate? Because if they could spend the $11 billion grant on cable and communication and, you, and the trench is already open and you're like, well, listen, they're already there, we'll do it. I didn't know till tonight that AT&T refuses to co-locate. That's not cool, but we'll talk about that later. So <laughs> if they can spend the $11 million on satisfying a number of things and you guys are already there and you know what? Let's just give it to them because we'd get around to North Bay Village later anyway. The total project cost might be $15 million instead of 30 right? If you tell me something has to change in the law, I'll do it tomorrow. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> we don't know enough about what the rules will allow for. I mean, if it's one circuit at a time, one block at a time, then you're not going to realize the benefit that you're asking for. Sunny Isles has $6 million more to go on their FPL project. Know about Sunny Isles? Yes. They've got six million dollars more to go. Yes. I may have suggested to them take a breath for a second. Instead of shelling out six million, you might want to work something out where, if that's an area that's a particular need, when rulemaking is done, you might not have to lay out the six million dollars right away. That way, that's not unfair to say, right? So I told them, I, I said, hold off for a second. Maybe you don't pay the six million dollars because maybe that's something that we can get paid for or, re or you know, to, to some extent. That's that's a fair statement, right? Yeah. Okay. You, you said something that was very interesting, and, and so did Senator Pizzo, and that is that AT&T will not co-locate when we're doing, if we were doing this, this project. If North Bay Village voted for, you know what, we're going to go forward with the undergrounding of our power and said, but we're not going to spend the, what is it, it's, it's about $11 million for AT&T and Atlantic Broadband, the polls are FPNL polls, and you said earlier. Somebody said you have to leave the polls until up until all the utilities Correct. are done. Correct. Correct. Well, if we said, well, we only want to underground the power, leave AT and T and Atlantic Broadband above ground. Do you still have to then maintain the polls and the save us eleven million dollars about there's a, the communications? There's a process to transfer ownership of the polls. So you would then work to transfer the ownership to. AT&T and or Atlantic Broadband, and we could save $11 million thereabouts if we wanted to only do power. Je Mr. Ratner, I, I was going to call you, Jack. I have a sneaking suspicion that AT&T does not want to all of a sudden adopt 25,478 linear feet of overhead poles just to, just to run cable. So I think maybe that, that could be something we can discuss later. I don't think they want to adopt 25,000 linear feet of 4.9 miles of, of pole. Of pole. Of pole. So I think maybe they should reconsider co-locating later, and that's something to talk about. Because I, don't, I don't think it should be an a la carte expense. I'm, I'm your state senator. I'll be here for at least a few more years if you have me, and I think that's ridiculous. So and, and, I, and just in fairness, right? Because that's the idea that we are, we refuse to co-locate. Well, I think I mean, is. That's what, that's what uh, let's. I'd like some clarification. Yeah. No. On that. What I yeah. meant by that is that FPL is the one that prefers to have their own trench, and the other two. Broadbanding in so eighteen. AT no, we we just require twelve inches of separation. Yeah. Right. So that's a separate three foot wide trench. Uh, if it, if that's the case, that's fine. But in my initial discussions, the idea was to have two separate tr trenches. One. If I may ask. So you, that's fine. Who gave? Who told you to make sure you keep it separate? Preferably uh, FPO yeah. when we were in discussion. Yeah. So. In, in I, I'm sorry, Crystal Ball. Apology accepted. No. <laughs> and the reason is. Um, the, the estimate that we gave them up there was assuming that FPL does their own work, okay? Probably 80% of the projects, um, the, titty, the, the city takes some ownership with reference to the installation, and so they all um, either use a, um, a joint trench where they'll put in FPL's conduit, and then they'll put in AT&T and and Comcast conduit or broadband's conduit on the other side. So the estimate that um, Jose was talking about assumes that FPL does everything, and he's right. I mean, we only put in our pipe and we covered the trench up, 
and then the next one comes by. That just extends the length of the project. Hmm. And then, Mr. Ryder, if, if I just hear sort of analogous to your point about what the cost is that you're, you're going to bear. Jose came up with, Jose came up with a $5,000 homeowner credit, basically. Yeah, an average five thousand dollars for contemplating what kind of I call it. A, I always call it a tie-in fee. Whenever we build roads up north and yeah, and lines and houses and apartments, we call it tie-ins. So, what do you estimate the average me or the median uh, tie-in cost is uh, per, uh, per door here? Uh, that's again five thousand dollars panel upgrades and. Mr. Rather thinks it's about a hundred thousand uh, dollars. So here's my point. We have 92,165 right. septic tanks in Miami-Dade County, okay? All of, all of my district of Miami Shores, El Portal, and Biscayne Park are all in septic. I have 1,255 in North Miami Beach, and some in North Miami. And I'm desperately trying to rip up, repair, and replace because the high water table, folks, not even four feet. I got some places in this district where it's six inches from septic drainage fields, which is going to obviously compromise the aquifer and water table and so on and so forth. And yet it's imperative that they hook up to a sanitary source system that Julie and I, Commissioner and I were kind of joking, the county commissions kicked the can down the road for so long that they actually haven't, you know, admired the, uh, applied to the uh, consent decree from the federal government since 2013. Anyway, I still think it's a good idea to get septics out of, the, out of the ground, and I still think it's good to have public sanitary sewer, and that comes at a cost, and what I've sort of discussed and contemplated with each municipality is, I don't, I don't know, $5,000 is enough. And if you got access to 3.1% money over 30 years, and Senor can get it for even cheaper for you on the street, so maybe you bore, you bore that as well. And it's a long-term debt obligation that goes, you get fixed prices, guaranteed prices on, on those connections, but we're in the same situation with septic tanks. Because you might not have to pay a tie-in fee, or you might be able to, to amortize the tie-in fee over a certain number of years, but you do have to remove the septic tank out of your yard. Now, that's going to be cost prohibitive to a lot of homeowners who don't have the money readily available, which is why it may be contemplated that it attaches to the home, not like a, a lien that can be exercised right away, but when the home is sold, almost like an easement, it's sold and the, and the price is recaptured. And I don't think people would oppose that. So I think in some situations where it's like, listen, yes, this was a $5,000 charge. You don't have to pay it up front, but should the home sell, then there's a recapture on it. That's reasonable. We're going to have to do that with seawalls, septic tanks, and I believe at some point underground of some sort of utilities. Yeah, it, it's it, you know because it's FPL site that says you know with with going now with the downpipe, uh, you're going to have to have your electrician. And I, I've done all this because we've been work uh, Commissioner Strout and I've been working on this for two years and doing all the research. Is as FPL says, since the work may trigger building codes that require older home wiring to brought to be brought up to today's standards, it's important. To check with the proper authorities, I, I did that so I know what it. I mean, just the meter can, and I have underground, right. was fifty one hundred dollars. I, I, I mean, that's a real number. I didn't have to do a trench. And if we're doing six hundred of those, I would like to think that, that the next Mr. Ratner next door is not paying fifty one hundred dollars. I would like to think economies of scale, whether it's seawall, septic, or that, that you're paying maybe eight hundred dollars. And it's worth it to you to have underground versus having overhead. And then the five thousand dollars that Jose has budgeted actually captures it when you're paying an economy of scale price and having the purchasing power of the entire municipality. Does that make sense? It it does. And um, if I was your neighbor, Mr. Ratner, I bet you we, we can get a better deal if we bought two of the same. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, well, I mean, just the panels themselves, it, they cost what they cost, even wholesale. Yeah, it, if I may, uh, you know, I think, you know, let's, let's think about it. Your neighbor, you and I, neighbors, and we want to put a fence up. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to hire the same contractor to put the fence up, right? Mm -hmm. So it's cheaper for both of us. Right. So potentially. So on my side. It, <laughs> with the pretty side on your side. How's okay. that? So the same thing would would happen with, you know, the different, uh, you know, upgrades that you, you, you may have. Some houses do, some houses don't. So, you you know, the city would, would definitely see seek a, a bid for an electrical subcontractor that, you know, would definitely uh, help every resident and say, this is the scope. You're going to you're gonna make money on some. You're not going to make money on others. So here's your opportunity. And and I think uh, maybe the average price is not 5000 Maybe it's lower. Maybe it's not. Maybe it is 10000 I mean, so, Maybe it homes, is 20000 Some homes, so, you know, Mr. Torrego's lucky. His home 
He, he's, I know he's, he's well, told us in the, the past. I spent the money to upgrade it because I, I wasn't going to sleep with the, <laughs> with the old panels. Textile, uh, right. with, with the old panels. So there, there are homes that won't need anything, but they're all still going right. to need a trench and the pipes and, yes. and the, the connections. Thank you. Okay. And one thing we, I think we need to keep in mind is that, and I appreciate the, uh, the residents you know, bringing up these concerns, there are multiple projects we have to take into consideration, not just the one that we're discussing here right now. And I think it's important just to consider the projects that have already been approved and are coming down the pipeline. Because North Bay Village is a freight train right now. We have the paving that people have been anticipating and wanting and, and you know, waiting for that to happen, understanding that if they want to be able to have this approved, this is not something that can be decided today. This is something that we have to be able to still put back on the ballot. And I remember bringing this up, I believe, in the June commission meeting. So you have a primary coming up in, in March we could be able to do it. So we had to make the decision for this to happen soon in December. You know, we have our November commission meeting and then December. So these are a lot of things that if you do want to be able to move on this, and I'm talking to the residents here and then also anybody, please reach out to us if this is something you have an interest in. But understand that my concern, and I can see both sides of this, it's the cost that will be bearing on the residents. And I get concerned because we have a very complex and diverse population in North Bay Village. Not everybody can be able to just come up with even just $500 if there was a bill that was to be able to come up. And we need to be mindful of that. I feel as if that, yes, there are particular issues that each island deals with that are unique to their island. I know that Treasure Island deals with flooding significantly more than what North Bay Island would deal with. And we have to be mindful of that. Just look at what happened with the current project that we've just been dealing with right now, how long it took. How, how many issues that we dealt with in regards to the concerns with the residents we're dealing with, individual base with private and public easement as well. Understanding that not everyone was also understanding the communication that was going about with those processes and dealing with the contractors to make sure that everybody understood what was happening. You're dealing with three entities that we had to be mindful of and communicating that to the residents. And you know, as our senator mentioned, beyond being able to do underground utilities, there are other additional expenses, especially with resiliency, that we need to be able to be considered of. If you have a property that is on the water, your seawall may have to be ris you know, rise as well. So that's an additional cost for you too. We have to look at everything in a full scope and understand everything that's already been approved. So I think when we do want to be able to go to the residents, we need to make sure we bring up everything together so that they can have a realistic mindset that if we are going to be able to request that they are going to be incurring costs of up to $5,000, additionally, if they want to have the full scope of what it's going to take to really bring this village to the 21st century, what is it going to be able to be bearing for their, their pocketbooks? Like what's going to be the overall cost? And I don't feel comfortable as your elected official representing you know, the at-large you know, seat, knowing that I'm only going to give you half of the information. Now, again, we do have all the information right now regarding, I feel as if we're underground, but the closest that we've come to for that process. But overall, there's a lot of other factors we need to take in consideration. But if anything, if we're to be able to put this on the ballot, I feel as if that we have the most amount of information available to us to educate our residents on this person alone. But understanding that the other products that we already have that residents are looking forward to, especially with paving of those roads, may have to be put on hold. I wonder if I might. Hi, Kevin Vericker, 7520 Hispanola. I think I have relatively quick questions, but first of all, uh, I'm glad you guys are all here. The last couple of times and the two elections we went through where we talked about it, nobody would come. So we kind of guessed what we thought it would cost. It's nice to hear that you're moving forward with this. Um, FP&L particularly, you have been through this now. I believe you said Jupiter Inlet and another town where you undergrounded. Uh, well, the closest one here that we've done, the whole municipality, is uh, Golden Beach. Okay which is kind of a lot smaller, but what I'm thinking is, do you know if there are any statistics available on how many homeowners had to redo their electrical systems in order to come up with the undergrounding? I, I think if you call those two cities, uh, Jupiter Island and Jupiter Island, Jupiter Island and um, the I'll get, I'll get you Golden Beach by Friday. Jupiter okay. Inlet Colony, yeah. Um, I think if you call those cities, they'll be more than willing to probably give you that information. Yeah, that sounds like Again. a piece of information that we would want to know to know how yeah. likely this is going to be. Because I have, I've yeah. lived in my house 21 years. I, I haven't looked at my electrical system. It seems to work. Yeah. So uh, didn't go a lot with that. Um, for the uh, the 
Oh, never mind. You actually just answered that. So uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a minimum number of houses that have to agree to undergrounding for it to be effective to move forward? I know we've talked about if one person says no, but what happens if 20 out of, say, let's say 20 percent of the people say no? Uh, what happens then? Uh, do we have a plan for that? Well, that would all be – that's all based on the city. I mean, okay. our, the way our tariff is written, um, as Jose mentioned, it, it's based on a qualifying project for our program. Okay. Is three pole line miles, which okay. you folks have four four point nine. Yeah. Okay. Um, if it was less than that, if it was less than three pole line miles, but you did the whole municipality, you would still qualify. That's a special circumstance. And then the um, the 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 next item is two hundred detached dwelling units. We call those that, that's a dwelling unit is what we call a single family home. Right. At least 200 overhead services need to be converted to underground. Okay. Okay. So, so it would have to be how, a minimum. Uh, yes. For example, Treasure Island of 200. That's of the to houses. qualify for the program. And I used to know how many houses there were on Treasure Island, but I've forgotten. So, but that would be an issue that the city would have to deal with then, and, yes. and bring you around in the ballot. Okay. My last question is for AT and T. Hello. Hi. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, <laughs> Actually, it oh, might be an Atlantic broadband question as well. But with the advent of 5G, mm -hmm. one of the things that I understand is that the uh, – and I have all the terminology wrong – but the 5G transmitter antennas need to be within 500 feet of each other. Yes. And one of my concerns is that we'll go to all of this trouble, we'll underground everything, it'll be lovely, and then we're going to have 5G transmitters popping up all over – the city. Um, is AT&T involved in the 5G? What is the experience? How are people responding, particularly in underground places? So, so this is a process that has just started. So before, yeah. I, I can honestly say, um, so before we even talk about um, 5G being brought to North Bay Village, one, that requires a change in the, communi the communications ordinance for the city, right? One, two, um, as part of our bill plan, as I understand it, because I'm not an engineer, right? right. But as I understand it, um, our, our cables can be undergrounded, but yes, those small cell facilities are going to need to be above ground. And so even if you do underground everything within the city, the small cell um, facility, in order for you to gain the benefit that is that comes with having 5G, it's going to have to be between 500 feet yeah. between each other, and they are going to have to be above ground. Somewhere between, right now, I'm told from our RAN team, 37 to 40 feet in the air, I believe it is. So So we're going to have a 30, let's say 35-foot tower about every 500 feet in no, order to have the small cell technology. Things, yeah. Up, yeah, yeah, up. Up 35 to 37, and then, yeah, but within okay. 500 feet. Um, is it... Well, that was going to be my last question, but this then brings up another one. Oh. Is uh, AT&T or the other companies that are planning to do this, are they attaching to current uh, so, overhead poles? So our, our priority is first to co-locate, right? Um, that is that No, is no. I heard that you're not doing that. <laughs> um, yeah. So our, our goal our, and our priority is to try to co-locate where we can. But in the event right. that there are, is not a poll available where we're going to need to provide that small cell okay. infrastructure, then we will have to go to the city to request a new poll. Does that, okay. does that happen anywhere? Um, yeah, we, we're, we're starting to get those requests, and, and, and it is happening. And so. Okay. Because I think that, that needs to be a consideration as well of taking all of this out and then finding out that we need new polls every – and I believe that's state-controlled, right? We don't have much say over that, Senator? Uh, the vote in the Senate was uh, 37 to 3. I was one of the senators that voted against allowing communications companies to go ahead and just put up wherever right. they wanted to put up. So yes, we really have no yes, local control yes, over yes. that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. So good evening, I'm Denise O'Brien. I live at 7935 East Drive in Harbor Island, and I am also chair of the Sustainability and Resiliency Task Force here for North Bay Village. So I will make two comments, one as chair, and then the second one as resident. So as chair of the task force, I want to reiterate um, what Commissioner Strauss said, that for us as a village, 
Um, if I could have undergrounding tomorrow and a ferry would come and it all would be done, we would all jump on it and we want it. But we are going to have to look at the priorities of everything we have to do and decide how we're going to be able to use those tax dollars. So this is something we have to look at as you said so well, so I want to just back you up, reiterate <laughs> that we're going to have to look at this as the full resiliency package and where this fits and where our tax dollars have to go. So now, having said that, um, I, I don't have a very, very strong opinion on uh, some people who spoke had strong opinions. I don't. But I did understand two things. First, regarding the total cost. Um, so this inch, it's a very interesting discussion we just had about G5, and therefore they're going to have to stay above ground. Um, for uh, Atlantic Broadband, what yeah. happens? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so in our case, uh, I mean, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's off the hook. Take, take it away from me. Yeah. So, yeah, so in our case, uh, obviously, with the renovation and putting new lines, we're bringing in more and more fiber every day to every community that we serve. So they, obviously that would serve the need of the community going to a much higher speed than what we serve today. Obviously that will be a, a la carte, obviously. And the fiber is underground? or I'm sorry, it will be, I'm it will, No, no, it will be totally underground. Totally underground. Yeah. So with, you with are already doing that? Is that moving ahead? That's outside of the so, package? So in communities where we come in, kind of like FPL, uh, you know, we, we try to go on the ground in new communities that we work in. Obviously in communities like this, we have to follow... FPL, so if FPL move on the ground, we will have to then uh, as well. So in down. that little chart that Jose put up there, the cost that was related to that, so is that a cost we're going to have to bear, or is it a cost that we won't have to bear if we go with FPL and you just put your fiber optics in well, I, 12 I think, inches apart from where I think you there are. is definitely an advantage of, uh, you know, everybody going together, but then, then again, just kind of bear in mind the same as when somebody's digging up the street or when they're... Uh, a transformer goes bad, if we are all in the same line, then there's chances that everybody's going to get damaged, and that's what Jose was trying to allude before. So the 12-inch apart is sufficient? Uh, it should be, but then again, also AT&T have to be honest. Okay, so, so total so cost, Jose, I, I'm left confused, and just excuse me because I'm not very good either with finance or technology. Um, I'm the environmental person. Uh, so I, I think we should look at that. So would that bring our costs down? I mean, AT&T, I, I asked a question, how many people here have landlines in this village, and the answer was six. So it doesn't look like we have to do anything about that. So I think we can get rid of that cost. Yeah, so, so is that the situation? If we only have six people using landlines, do we still need lines? AT&T is more than, than <laughs> like, you get like, like AT&T and broadband is the same thing, the same technology right now. Yeah. They get your fiber optic and they provide you with. The you want to trade spots? You want to come check my I'm not letting you off the hook. Give me an answer. As much as I love Louise and adore him, you give me an answer. Um, that, is a, that is a question that, because I don't want to sit up here and, and, and misinform, that I would definitely need to go back and ask that question. If you only found, I don't know the number of landlines. Is that an exact number or is that just an estimation? Let's say that that's a good number, that that's the right number. Let's assume it is. It might not be because I got it from hearsay from somebody who happened okay. to be standing there that I will s not say who it was, but fine, someone who's fine, a high level fine. official in this village. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so now total cost, we got something to work with here. It looks like we might be able to save money on that. We may, may be able to save money on that, six inches apart. So I think we have to look at these total costs again. I don't think. But I, I now. No, John, like I said, Denise just changed it to six inches. Oh, I know. I heard that. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. 12, 12, 12, 12. My, my fault. So now, um, Senator Pizzo, you talked about uh, Mexico City, if I got it correctly, a pilot project that you guys were doing? No, I want to be very clear. Last legislative session, mm. what was what's put into effect, but still has to go through a process of how it's going to play out, is effectively that FPL has permission and the authority to then take a full list of all 412 municipalities in Florida, find an area, find the areas of greatest need where there's outages, where they they keep having to go back, where there's redundant problem and problem and problem start with the worst city, okay. by the worst I mean where they have the least amount of reliability. And the so that's what I want. So the definition is reliability. One, and yeah, So from 1 to 412. Now, if they just finish undergrounding Golden Beach, 
I expect Golden Beach is going to be like 410 or 11, or you know, with everybody else. Not at the top the of the list. They won't be on the list. They the Golden, be on the list. Golden Beach will pay. Because they're, no, 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 listen, listen, no? Ryan. They won't even be on the list oh, because right. they're already underground. Right. So oh, start taking the gotcha, out, gotcha. The remaining overhead cities that have overhead, uh -huh. starting with the worst reliability and the, and the greatest need, all the way down. Now, uh, I don't know if it was Mr. Ratner or Mr. Rosenberg that was talking about the power went out here, the power went out there. There's a gentleman who's taken over, I think locally here, Christopher Ferreira. He's excellent. I'll text him, I'll say, hey, listen, this street's out, tell me what's going on. And he tells me that 15 mm -hmm. minutes, the power's been out twice or three times in the last week, this is what happens, this is what the schedule is. He does it for all 15 cities in my district, okay. including yours. So do you know where we are on that list? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. There's not a list. There's not a list. Okay. Knows yet. Knows. Okay. So if we, but if we kick the buck down the road a bit, we might. So this is something this to is take why, into consideration. This is why I'm wondering. Yeah. This is why I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. If they have, if North, if your city has access to 11 million dollars from FEMA. Yeah. Okay. I'm pleading my ignorance as to the, the application of those dollars and whether or not this is what I can sort of help with is in talking to. Their colleagues at FPL frequently in Tallahassee, and basically discussing with them, is it unreasonable to say, I know maybe North Bay Village isn't one to ten or fifth, maybe they're not even up in the top 100 on the list, but if there's going to be trenching and there's going to be a project and we're going to be up uprooting the roads and putting easements and tie ins for people's houses, can we make an exception where you kind of just go then? Where we can have, where it's like, oh, listen, you're already open, you skip to the head of the line. But we won't be trenching unless they're coming. I mean, our trenching will be them. Well, I would say yes or no. Do yeah. I think that you guys are going to start a five-year trenching project just for Atlantic? Atlantic? I don't think so. No. Just for at &T? No. I don't think so. For so. I, I think you would. Yeah. Okay? When I say Mexico City, Mexico City Beach doesn't have the money to go underground their entire city. Okay. They have less resources than you guys do here. Okay? So, we're, we're, in, a, in a kind of we're all in this together kind of idea, you're going to be paying for Mexico you know, City and Panama City. You're going to be paying for Ocala and Gainesville. But then when you get to, when people get their FPL bills in Sunny Isles and Bell Harbor and Indian Creek, they're going to be paying yours. So we literally all are all in this together. Yeah, so if we're all in this together, I think we've got to do a bit more work on what the total cost is. It doesn't, it seems that the estimates we got here, we might be able to work on because we might be able to put things together and we might be able, we might not be having to do for the, the specific telephone services, even though I understand all the other services. Um, now I take off resiliency hat, put on residency hat. We talked about Treasure Island and we talked about uh, <laughs> Bay View, uh, uh, Island. I'm from uh, Harbor Island. So in Harbor Island, it's buildings. What happens and how much does it cost for a building to hook up to this system? Uh, and you certainly will have a lot less number of different individual property owners in that island. So do we know what the costs are? So in, for the larger, so for the condos, we'll use that yeah. as an example. Those buildings are... Um, sometimes it's fed by a vault, which is an electrical room inside the building that contains the FPL equipment, which means it's already fed underground from maybe the overhead lines that are out near the road. So the tie-in individual units, you're already underground essentially. So when we convert the main line, you would then be tied into the new underground main line, but your line that goes into your building is already underground. So is that been already? Yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry. The estimate only includes single-family homes right. for that same reason. Okay. So So the wires that you saw in the picture, because you showed a picture yes, of Harbor Island. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> so, so no wire goes from right. a pole in the street to the corner of a, of a condo building. Correct. Okay. So okay. Yeah, so will those poles stay there? If you underground, then they're not gonna, they should not be there. So, okay. So the, the estimate that we gave includes undergrounding the line, the main lines along the road, that currently tie into your underground. So, so we so project. buildings don't have uh, that much. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Harbor Island. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everybody. Hi, I'm Dale Penn. Uh, I live at the Lexi at 7901 Hispanola Avenue, and I just wanted to thank you. I feel like you guys have been told a lot of things. Um, I'd like to ask some questions. Uh, First of all, I was curious, the budget. I mean, to me, this feels like a condo meeting, actually. I've lived in condos all my life. And so it's like 
it's kind of like that concept. And it's kind of hard to wrap your head around a little bit, I think, if you're a single family homeowner. And I've been that as well. But we are all in, all in this together, I mean, if we choose to be. Um, so my question, I guess, on the budget side, it sounded like some people are saying that the cost is greatly more than what you've got in your budget to link into the system and actually hook up. Uh, maybe as much as, uh, you know, 10 times as much or 20 times as much. In the experience of the experts who are here, have you seen that? Is a $5,000 number that's in our budget, is that a reasonable estimate for an overall average? Um, when we do these projects, we, I, I, you know, and, I, and I've been doing most of them, we don't get into the, um, the municipal side of the project. We just focus on ours to keep ours at that number that we all agreed upon. And you said that you have like a 10% um, Yeah, there's leeway. a 10% um, adder, uh, you know, moving forward if, you know, if the costs escalate. And is the 10% escalation already built into your budget for the high end? I, I have a 25% contingency built in my, into my estimate. So your budget actually is quite conservative, in you, your opinion? For, for my, based on my research, in my opinion, and, 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 but it, this doesn't mean that, as the previous resident expressed, that if you're going to encounter a home that is, uh, has to upgrade everything there is to be uh, with regards to electrical, then of course you're going to you're going to have that difference right. in that particular case, because I, I it's just impossible right now for us to go home by home and let's let's make an estimated value of how much the, everyone's electrical upgrades are going to But again, take. having so, lived in a condo for a right. while, I mean, well, what we I do mean, is no, negotiate right. a contract with right. contractors. Now, right. Of course, then we do a budget, and then right. often the budget isn't the, right. The key thing is to define that scope right? because that's what's going to drive exactly. that cost. So it's what we were saying prior is like, listen, uh, you, you may have a scope that's going to take you all the way up to that limit, but right. you may have a, another scope because of another house that's just going to be like, it may well be under five thousand dollars, so right. it's it's very difficult. So that's why uh, you you try to pinpoint an average, and 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 on top of that, I went ahead and just said let's let's add a twenty five percent contingency okay. cost to that. So I, I think when you look at the 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 large number that we're looking at, when you look at the bottom line number, I mean, just for, as a resident. I mean, that's not too scary to me as a resident of a condominium. I mean, it's like, wow, I'm paying more than that for my special assessment for um, what we're working on right now in our building. So I realize there are people that can be impacted by even a $5 increase in everything, but you can't stop progress because, just because of a small number of people that, that are going to be put into a hardship situation by a $5 change. That, that was what, that's the only comment I'd like to make. Um, at the Lexi, we're, I believe, already undergrounded. So um, one of the things that comes up whenever we talk about these, these, uh, uh, the, um, not remediation, what, the, uh, what you do. Uh, yeah, sea level rise uh, <laughs> issues is that certain people say, oh, I'm not paying a penny to help you take care of what's on your property. I'm not paying a penny in, in taxes for that. I've heard that. And it's like, again, in a condo situation, you don't think that way. We, you know, we're all in this together. So my question is, is that, um, you know, we're, now let's put, a, if I'm that person, I live in the Lexi, it's already undergrounded. Am I gonna have to pay that, that go bond fee, um, that go, additional go bond uh, debt that, that's being, Incurred, even though we're undergrounded. You want to take Sorry. that one? Okay. The general obligation bond is issued by North Bay Village. Every single resident in North Bay Village is on the board, correct? Correct. Okay, I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm just telling. I'm telling you that there are people in the community who, I mean, if you don't know it, <laughs> every single who are property be owner, not necessarily just a home. Right, but there are people who feel that they shouldn't have to pay if, uh, if they object to the idea. So, yeah, like, so for example, you know, everyone has to be able to come together in that community mindset, and that's right. what's going to, you know, kind of build up to that. And again, you know, I want to just be mindful. Again, as someone who did go door to door and seeing the houses and seeing the condominiums, and these 
a lot of them are not up to code. So I think that that's something when we're looking at Jupiter Island and Golden Beach, uh, those houses may be maintained over a period of time, and and I think we have to be mindful of our residents and how they, you know, the, the houses. So we have to be considering those additional costs. But I do appreciate your comment on that deal. I know that I want to make sure that our representatives and also Senator Pizzo, I want to thank everyone for their time. Does anybody have any additional questions? I want to be mindful and respectful with that too. Okay. Am I taking too much time? No, Sorry. no, no. Of course. Okay. Um, is this, does the additional in, uh, debt that we're incurring for this project affect our our rating at all? Um, no, because you will um, your municipality will tax whatever it takes to uh, pay for the debt service. Okay, and um, as you mentioned, sea level rise, uh, the sea level rise issues, the uh, taking care of uh, resiliency issues um, would. I'm sure that's something that we're looking at across the state, right? Um, so um, I, w I guess I would ask the senator, I mean, are other communities looking at possibly raising the level of their, their properties, uh, rezoning so that, uh, and so what happens, and then to you, what happens with uh, the current undergrounding if we do end up with five feet of additional soil I on new properties. Your question that was directed towards me. Yep. Uh, my house is built in 2007. It sits four and a half feet higher than my next door neighbor's house. Mm -hmm. Just because. Different code. Right. Go. Also, but, but reflective, we had a number of things that were about to pass last year that would have been very cost prohibitive for people. One of them was retrofitting buildings to put fire sprinklers in that were over 75 feet. And I don't want to be the elected official who ever voted for something or against something where a grandmother was killed in a fire in a condo, but the, the, the greater pressing reality is that hundreds of grandmothers are going to be displaced because they can't afford a special assessment of $10,000. So I wanted to be realistic about it. So to your point, yeah, new building codes coming in, things that have to be adjusted. Miami Beach, obviously, you see is doing a whole entire project, raising roadways and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I, go, I go back to, listen, it's a sticker shock number to see X number of millions of dollars, then to find out it might be plus or minus 10, 15, 20 percent. I would not rely on the numbers that you saw, good or bad. I just, and with all respect to, to Mr. Oliva, he called the ass based either on a lineal, linear feet with three feet, three foot wide, 2960 and everybody gave honest answers of what, of what the median prices are for those projects. But that might be completely whatever. Don't rely on the numbers. Okay, don't but, rely on the numbers. But going fast forward to yep. you and I think a lot of people to see a single family detached home has to go out of pocket $2,875 over 30 years, it's de minimis. And Even if it's 50% more than that. Absolutely. And and and, uh, and Lourdes made a very good example of just taking a 1% conservative uh, appreciation. It's been far out for the number of years and so on and so forth. I'm most concerned legitimately concerned for the 15 cities of my district at this point to be really honest with you and everybody here about preservation. I get a lot of blowback and resistance from other agencies who don't want to don't want to allow one of my cities in the district to have a, a 25 by 45 square foot easement for a pump station to convert 87 homes from septic to sewer and nobody has to pay for anything. Where the small community wastewater treatment program for DEP will give 87 homes septic to sewer conversion and then the city has to pay 20% of the cost once it's online and working at 50 basis points. Ha one half of 1% over 20 years. That's cheap money. That's cheaper than you can get it. That's cheap money. Right. And guess what? Guess what? I'm going to be very honest. The school board has taken 13 months to come around with an agreement of what they want, what they want for rent on that small little sliver of Horace Mann Middle School. And I explained to the principal and to the school board, you might not have 87 homes with kids going to school next year if the water table keeps rising into a septic. So get out of the way. And that happens with a lot of situations. Listen, these guys, they want to use best practices. If they had their druthers, I'm sure everyone here at this table would take underground over overhead at your own home. Yep. Yes? yes? But you know what? If it doesn't make economic sense, if the political will is not there, if that's not what the majority of people want, then so be it. But I'm concerned about preservation. I think you should, we should be using best practices. And if you built a brand new development anywhere in the country right now, you wouldn't be using overhead if you had your option. But if I'm hearing, yeah. if I'm hearing you correctly, we may be in a position where, let's say we do put it on the ballot next year, we're paying our $33 million to, uh, to do this, even with the wonderful $11 million FEMA grant. It's, so we're paying 20 
two million. Um, and then the state goes statewide with the 412 list. What happens to us? I mean, are we like the, the poor student that paid off his student loan debt and then it's forgiven? What I'm going to try to do over the next few weeks is get some clarity as it relates. And I was going through rulemaking. I want to get some clarity. and I want to be able to, to say this. Yes, you go by the list, whenever the list comes out and however it's triaged, okay, and literally however, uh, however it's, uh, it's assimilated, I just want to be able to say in the, ch in the off chance that there's a city that's willing to go it alone or pay a premium, basically to skip the line to some extent, or in a situation like this where they actually have resources that are time sensitive or project sensitive or project specific, can, can there be exceptions? And I th I'm sure I'm not thinking of an exhaustive list of those numbers of exceptions, Thanks. but this is one of them, mm -hmm. where, hey, we got $11 million of federal money to play with, you know, to use. What's the best use of those dollars? But I'll tell you, if we were doing a brand new development, FPL would be laying lines anyway. Yeah. Whatever cable provider or cable service company would be laying them anyway, and they wouldn't be necessarily billing the homeowner. They'd be billing the developer. Right. right. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Right. So I just want to know if we can skip the line, not putting anyone's life at peril or safety or risk because they have the capacity to make sure they have the work crews. We can use the $11 million to skip the line to accelerate when the schedule is going to be. That's it. And I've been saying okay. that to Ralph for months and months and months. Good. I'd well, like to make a clarification to your question. Every time you issue debt, it does affect your credit rating. Okay. However, we would be responsible enough to ensure that we would never issue so much debt that the residents couldn't afford it. And we'd look at medium household income and all those calculations before we issue the debt. Okay, but you haven't done that no. calculation at this point. Right. There's no okay. point in paying for those right. calculations if you haven't moved far enough. Okay. Uh, so one last question to AT&T. Uh, the five... G, um, if we're going to have polls again, um, are we going to have polls again, or could they be put on put on buildings? Or if we if we are undergrounding in North Bay Village, you will likely have polls because we're going to need them in order to put this facility on. Okay, then the question goes to FPL. Then is there a way to reinforce the existing infrastructure so that we don't have so many power outages above ground? <clears throat> probably said this a few times in prior meetings um, the bulk lines that we have I think the ones r r like like running along here um, are feeder circuits uh, we've told the Public Service Commission by the year 2024 um, all our feeder circuits will be hardened okay so today they're not hard okay so um, I think I mentioned by the year 2022 that either this place is going to go underground or we're going to harden those overhead circuits that feed the bulk of the, the power back and forth. Okay. <clears throat> so. But that's not every street. That, Pardon me? That's not every street. That's, that's not just every street. The, it's okay. just the feeder circuits themselves, not the okay. laterals. Thank you very much. What does it mean to harden them? What, exactly yeah. what does it mean to harden them? How would it look different? In, in most cases, um, we went with a concrete pole. Okay. okay. So instead of a wood pole, it would be a concrete pole, a bulkier pole. Um, however, there are other instances where we put intermediate poles. So in, in essence of if you have a, a pole line of, of 10 poles, you might end up with a pole line of 18 poles. So consider the cost. If you were to do that in the residential area, Sorry. Is it possible to make this type of project more cost effective by hardening the poles in the residential neighborhoods as well as just here on the main line? Would that how does that change the cost profile of this if those hardened if that hardened infrastructure will stand up much better? Maybe that's an option. Well, you always have the option to, to keep everything, you know, overhead. I mean, because because you have, we were going to come in here. We were going to come in here and harden the feeder poles. Okay. Okay. And the and, and the city told us to stop, so we stopped. Okay. If you want to do the internal structures, right? The the laterals is what we call them that yeah. go behind the houses. Um, that is the list that we're going through right now 
in order to harden that, that that's part of that list. And if and I, and all I'm, I'm suggesting is, you know, what whatever the ultimate build out cost happens to be. I mean, I won't even use the 33. I'm going to say 50 million dollars just for fun, okay? My point really is this, if you could do the hardening in within the residential neighborhoods for something a lot less than that amount of money and avoid all the trenching and still have a system that is more resilient than what we had to have today if the cost differential is is is, is considerable then why not give that greater consideration so when john when john mentions hardening yeah. we mean our our main trunk lines so the main go along the main road. So in the neighborhood, I understand that. They're, the in, they're the smaller lines, the taps, the pillars, okay. the laterals. That is not part of our hardening program today. And most of those poles are typically in the rear of the property. Understood, but so, you'd be going into the well, rear of my property anyway. So to harden those poles, he mentioned concrete poles. Right. Constructability-wise and maintenance-wise, we, we can't put concrete poles in the rear of because they can't climb them in order to maintain them. Why can't they? You mean you need a bucket truck? Exactly. So you say there's no no potential to put rungs or anything to climb up a concrete pole? They be, those, become, those become safety issues. So, for example, there are crews, when the crews climb the poles, there are some times where they hit a weak part, part of the pole and they may cut out, they may fall. So those rungs then become a safety issue in the rear of with obstruction. So we have to balance the need to maintain the grid. So our practice is not to put concrete poles in the rear of because it makes it harder to maintain in the long run. And it becomes more of a safety issue. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. AT&T is putting up concrete poles with their 5G, 45, 50 feet up in the air but, and with runs. So are they okay climbing the concrete poles? They're accessible. They're accessible. You mean they're street accessible? Yeah. Yes, they're on the they're Okay. On the accessible by so let me ask you this. In light of, of this being an issue, is there not a design option to create concrete poles that your folks can climb safely? So this ties back into our pilot. Right. So the pilot of us going in and identifying laterals that we can underground, those laterals are in the rear of. That, that pilot brings them out to the front of. Because we okay. don't want hardening in the rear of is an operational we, we, safety issue. So you to tie into the back of Mr. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg's house in the front of his house. Exactly. Okay. Well, we now have street lights sitting in the front of of our property right. anyway. Well, Could, underground too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> But the point is, why not have a pole in each spot that you have, you know, or even if you have to put more of those poles? The point is, you have the precedent already where you've got poles installed at the front of the properties. Let's do something. Let's consider something that might be a better solution f at this point, okay? And I still maintain that ultimately North Bay Village is going to have to do something huge that we've got that we just went through this exercise with with DPZ to become more resilient, right? We're going to have to do something. We're going to be underwater. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And as far as I'm concerned, when we get started on that kind of a project, that is the time to fold a different type of infrastructure project into it. So I maintain. I don't think you're going to be able to peg the cost of this underground project right now with any degree of reliability. It's not, and it's not about people absorbing a hundred bucks per thousand, uh, per hundred thousand valuation. We don't know what the number's going to be. And let's go back to the other issue. We still don't know on an individual basis what type of financial burden all the homeowners are going to face. And let's and I can't and we're not comparable with Golden Beach, okay? We're just not. So somebody there maybe can afford a lot of people there maybe can afford fifty grand, a hundred grand, not that big a deal. Here, totally different story. And uh, you know, if it if it takes just a few property owners who don't have the wherewithal to come up with those funds to halt the entire project, I I, I just don't think that this is feasible. Thanks. Yeah, 
Simple. Because people talk about millions and simple. People have to talk about millions and millions and millions and hundreds of thousands and people get nuts. In summary, for the average property homeowner or property owner is twenty five dollars a month. With that, you get a, m a more reliable system, a more beautiful s city. Plus, for the minority, for a, for a minority, I'm not going to say small, for a minority of the homeowners, including me, that we own fa single family homes, the minority of the residents of this city, we may have to incur an additional cost to bring our homes to code but we will get more safe at home and we will avoid getting killed by a fire when we are sleeping. Just overall, that's because people over there, that's what they understand. And this is the summary, in my opinion, of what we just talked about. Guten Morgen at 7517 Cutlass Avenue. I'm a resident here since 1972, so I went through and up and down all the hurricanes. We were promised several times by, by Florida Power and Light we would be upgraded. We were not. Every time, um, what's it called? So it's, um, the, the thing that blows up in our backyard on the post. Blows up, they come, they exchange it, that's it. But that's not the question that I have right. Do you have any idea how many residents, houses, residential houses, have upgraded the electric wiring? I don't think it's a minority. I think it's a majority that has not. And I have upgraded my house six or seven years ago, and I pay $10,000. It's much more today. And I think the city is obligated to let the residents know if, if we go underground, we voted twice for it, I voted twice for it, things have, have changed. The city is obligated to notify every homeowner, this is what it costs you. Do you want, still want it? Are you with us or are you are not? And I think that's a very important point. Ma'am, if you if may, I, I'm sure this commission will do so, and I, I assure you, I promise you, that nobody's going to be unfairly surprised by anything in this process. I could be very unpopular at times, but it's usually because I'm telling the truth. So nobody's going to have any unfair surprises in North Bay Village well, about what it costs. Well, it has been in the past. I'm I mean, I'm, I'm, I know everything listen, changed. Was total, all, total turnaround. I know that. My predecessor called always, FPL to get her power back on, her power back on at yeah. her house, and nobody else's during the last hurricane last two, a couple of years ago. Don't get me started, okay? <laughs> Nobody's going to be unfairly surprised by what it costs to make an informed, educated decision of yes or no, in addition to, but while I'm sure there's no commitments tonight, I'm sure this city's going to bend over backwards to find economies of scale and purchasing power to make it affordable to as many people as possible. And you have that assurance from me. Yeah, but that's because that's really important. Absolutely, absolutely. Because my, my, my two we sons, heard now, my, as we heard now, the minority yeah. has not have, have, have. I don't think so. I disagree with that. My two sons are sitting in the very back who have to go home and do their homework, go to bed, and they'll tell you that their father's not a BSer. Okay. All okay. Right. And you know me, I'm always available, literally twenty four seven. So if anybody needs you for questions on anything, you can always be able to you know, call me or text me or email me. I'm always available. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to thank everybody who tuned in, all the residents who addressed their questions and concerns, our representatives um, from all our utilities, as well as, um, you know, thank you to our staff for helping to be able to facilitate this, um, and then also to um, Senator Pizzo for being here as well. So thank you, everybody. And again, if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me or the administration. Thank you again. Gracias. How are you? Thank you. Thank you.
make point. Use the house is safe. If you bring it up to court, the better we be. Better be still by your family state. No bring